All right. So, hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for being here. I'm Paul D'Ambrosio. I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University. Today, Sahai Weisya is very happy to host Professor Stephen Engel and his talk on progressive Confucianism in the 21st century. The Sahai Weisya project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the conventional practices of contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, jerks, <clears throat> or what Robin Wong called in our last session, roosters. Um, and we hope to curb other types of aggressive and egoistic academic exchange as well. We seek to accomplish this um, change in academic orientation by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, and collaborative learning together. As many of us know all too well, miscommunication and missed communication can have disastrous results from ordering the wrong food to starting wars. With the goal of fostering an environment of real honest exchange and open communication, Sahai Weisya encourages unselfish, anti-egoist and actual questions and responses. Here we have less of an emphasis on learning about Chinese philosophy and we take learning from Chinese philosophy as our guiding directive. And I think Professor Stephen Engel's uh, talk is a perfect example of learning from Confucianism, right? I'm sure there's a lot of learning about Confucianism. Yeah. The emphasis uh, might be a little bit more on learning from Confucianism. So let us learn from one another and let us learn together. Uh, I want to thank Professor Li Zi Fen for chairing this session um, and professors, all right, Lisa, I'm trying it. Lisa, in, oh no, I, I don't remember. It's okay, it's in Dracolo. In I can self-introduce yeah. myself. <laughs> I already forgot, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> and Professor Feng Xiu Dong for their initial comments. Um, before handing things over to Professor Lee, I just want to remind everyone that next week at the same time, um, we have an additional discussion session. So, and we really encourage especially graduate students to attend. I'll put the link uh, in the chat, but it's also on the website. So, and that's really just totally open to anyone who's interested. It's a sort of a laid back format where you just get to discuss uh, Professor Engel's talk or anything related. Um, he probably won't be there, so you can disagree with him a little bit if you want. <laughs> you can have a good time. Um, it's, you can disagree with me today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, and then you can continue to disagree, I guess. <laughs> All right, so um, thanks again, Professor Lee, for chairing the session. I'll hand things over to you. And okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Collaborative Learning Project, Sihai Wei Xue. Uh, firstly, I really need to say thanks to Paul for inviting me to be here to join this project. Um, it's very interesting. Um, my name is Li Jifen from Jimin University of China. Um, I'm very happy to be here to chair today's lecture. Uh, so today we have Stephen Engel to give lecture on growing moral, living as a progressive Confucian in the 21st century. So the topic here is about the progressive Confucianism, which is also called Jin Bu Ru Xue in Chinese. Um, I think this project, Professor Stephen has already worked on it for many years. Um, before we move on to his lectures, I will briefly introduce Engel here. So actually, I know Professor Stephen for many years. In 2016, he came to Tsinghua University as a Berkeley scholar, Berkeley uh, fellow for uh, Gurei Xuezhe. So at that time, I invited him to Renmin University to give a talk, to give a lecture on the political philosophy, um, something like that. So since that, we have lots of, uh, we do have lots of connections after that. Um, so uh, Professor Stephen, uh, really knows Chinese philosophy very, very well. And he can speak Chinese, he can speak Mandarin very fluently, and also he's good in classical Chinese readings. I think I'm very impressive in this. Um, he has spent many years as a Fulbright scholar in both in Taipei and also in Beijing. 
So maybe I think that is uh, one reason why he is so good at Chinese philosophy. <laughs> Um, he has published many books and essays, and I think some of them have has already been translated into Chinese under his Chinese name An Jingru. So among them, uh, among the publications, I, I really need to mention about this one. That is about the contemporary Confucian political philosophy toward uh, progressive Confucianism. This is the book I think Angle will also talk about today because he, it is really related to the topic today. Um, yeah, so I think for the introduction part, I will stop here. And next I will give time to Professor Stephen to, uh, pre to give the lectures. Yes, please. All righty, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lee. It's wonderful to see you again and to see some other old friends and, and uh, look forward to learning from, from everybody here. Um, the, I, I would genuinely love to have people raise questions and challenges. Um, I think that the, the spirit of this uh, series of, uh, of events, um, the Siha uh, Weishue, uh, is really terrific. It's the way that academia should be done. And, uh, uh, and maybe a little lightheartedly, as, as Paul started us out, that uh, so we don't have to take ourselves so seriously. Um, but yeah, it's great to uh, be here. Let me see, let me share my screen here. I'll do that and that and that and that. All right, does that look like it probably is supposed to look? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, so uh, I do indeed have uh, in the background uh, the, the book that uh, that Professor Lee just referred to, um, uh, but in the foreground for me is actually a new book, um, uh, which is called Growing Moral, A Confucian Guide to Life, came out last spring from Oxford University Press. And this is the first time that I've actually tried to write a book that I hope uh, lots of people will read. Um, uh, it's not an academic book in the conventional sense. Um, uh, it consists of a lot of short chapters uh, that aim to uh, introduce what it is to live a Confucian life in the contemporary world to um, anybody who's who's intrigued by that by that notion. Um, uh, and so that I'm going to be drawing on on bits of the uh, of this book as we go. Um, and dividing the talk into four different sections. So the first is to talk a little bit about the way that I'm thinking about Confucianism, um, uh, what I'm calling my orienting premises, uh, and the emphasis there is gonna be on it as a living, growing tradition. Um, the second uh, part of the talk um, is going to look at the idea of growing in another sense, um, uh, more directly growing moral, um, uh, and talking about the, the sort of disparate ways that Confucians think of the beginning points of that moral growth. And one of the things that I try to do in this book is to uh, draw really on uh, the whole Confucian tradition. Um, and of course, there are some inconsistencies within the tradition. So I, I grapple with that a little bit. The third part of the talk turns to uh, many of the different uh, things that we need to do in order to grow morally. And at that point, I'm, I'm gonna put in a uh, sort of a table of contents uh, or at least a, uh, many of the topics that I cover in the book and then drill down and talk about one of them in a little bit more detail, uh, which is the way in which reading according to many uh, folks in the tradition is important. And then I'm going to end. Thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, the final part of the talk is going to be to um, sort of return to the idea of growth. Um, uh, but in this case, the way in which the tradition itself needs to continue to grow. Uh, and that's through thinking about uh, ways in which the uh, oppression is a problem that Confucians have sort of partially recognized in uh, in in the history of the tradition, um, uh, but I think that there are ways in which Confucians should become much more explicit critics of oppression, and I will uh, 
investigate that. So that's the general overview. And that should take, oh, I don't know, about 40 minutes or so from here. So it's very important to me that Confucianism is not just something uh, that we attribute to Kongzi or indeed just to classical Confucianism. I think that Kongzi himself thought of the tradition as uh, thought of what he was engaged in as something that had started before him. He's not the founder uh, of, uh, of something as much as a, a very important early articulator. Um, uh, and that notion of Confucianism as a uh, something that is passed on, that it, people debate over, um, uh, and that, that grows and changes over time in response to new circumstances, uh, is something that I think that we can we can see for 2,500 to 3,000 years. Um, the important phases of the tradition, or some of the most important phases of the tradition, I've got here on this screen. Um, uh, let me highlight the fact uh, that, as many of, uh, many of you, of course, are very familiar with, uh, but that by the uh, period that we call Neo-Confucianism, uh, Confucianism is very explicitly moving uh, into areas outside of China. Um, it's never something that was conceived of, I would say by anybody in the, in the tradition as the sole property of one place. Um, uh, certainly not of China because there was no such thing as China when, uh, uh, when Kongza was, was alive and teaching. Um, uh, he didn't think of it as applying just to the state of Lu. Um, uh, and indeed, it doesn't just apply to East Asia. Um, it's now the case uh, that you find people uh, identifying as Confucians, engaging with Confucian practices and thoughts um, all over the world, admittedly um, uh, not to the degree that some other sorts of uh, traditions have spread over the world. I think that, uh, I think of Buddhism in particular as um, uh, so far much more successful uh, outside of the sort of homelands of its, of its earlier growth. But nonetheless, uh, new Confucianism, if we can call it that in the 20th and 21st centuries um, uh, is a global phenomenon to at least some degree. So that's the Confucianism that I'm thinking about. Nonetheless, uh, we certainly have to acknowledge that Confucianism is in a certain sense conservative. If it weren't conservative, then this whole thing about tradition wouldn't matter so much. Um, uh, and we know uh, that famously in the Analex uh, uh, 7 1 records, uh, Kongza is saying that he transmits rather than invents. Shu um, uh, or So there is a, a kind of a conservatism in the tradition. Um, uh, and so it's important to ask, well, what kind of conservatism? What, what exactly is going on? Um, what are we transmitting? And what are we supposed to avoid doing uh, in, in not inventing? Um, and I think it's pretty clear that we're not supposed to invent things out of whole cloth. Uh, we're supposed to have learned from our uh, predecessors, from our ancestors, uh, from earlier moments in this tradition. Um, uh, there is a great deal of experience, wisdom, and insight uh, to be found in the tradition. Uh, so that's what's to be passed on. Nonetheless, it's built into the very earliest um, uh, articulations of this tradition that it does change. Um, the, uh, the Analects itself talks about the ways in which the, uh, the regulations and rituals um, of even earlier dynasties than that of, of Kongs' own um, uh, were themselves changing, right? Uh, and we can, we can know what sort of changes those were. And there's many other instances um, uh, from classical Confucianism down to even more explicitly uh, Neo-Confucian reflections on the sorts of uh, changes, developments, and so on uh, that are appropriate. So in a contemporary perspective, we have to think about how we do this, what it means to, to conserve the tradition in the appropriate way. And perhaps an overly simplified, but I think a, a helpful way to, uh, to frame the question is, do we conserve the institutions of the past or the values? Um, uh, and my, one of my fundamental arguments is we should be aiming to conserve the values that we find at the core of the tradition. Um, uh, and then we should be 
seeking to develop institutions, perhaps carry on uh, pre-existing institutions, um, uh, but as, as needed, develop institutions that will best enable us to realize those values. Um, uh, and so uh, that might well mean some pretty significant institutional change. Um, uh, indeed, if you think about political institutions, it's hard to find a Confucian who advocates monarchy, straightforward monarchy today, which of course was the political structure of traditional Confucianism for almost its entire history. Um, uh, so the fact of institutional change um, uh, seems very clear. Uh, and I think that's a fine thing, something that Confucians should support and applaud when we see that it is consistent with a certain sort of conservatism. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and so another traditional category that I wanna uh, endorse uh, is the category of Dao Tong, um, uh, which, it's, which I think we can gloss, if not exactly translate as the continuing rearticulation of the tradition. Um, what, uh, what philosophers do, it seems to me, um, those with a, a, a historical consciousness, but an eye on the present, is look back at the sources on which they draw, the, um, uh, the traditions that influence them, and uh, try to sort of stitch together a narrative, tell a story about how it is we got to where we are and what should be grounding and orienting us in the present day. That's what the Dao Tong is. Um, uh, and the Dao Tong, as, uh, as viewed um, uh, from my perspective, is going to put more weight on some voices in the tradition than others. Um, uh, I think that, that's as it should be. And it may be that others' Dao Tongs are not exactly the same. And that as we move forward, it might be that we realize that there are other, other things in the past that we should highlight um, uh, that have been neglected. So at any rate, it's a combination of conservatism and a kind of creativity. Um, that's the progressive, cons progressive Confucianism uh, that I'm uh, talking about. I think it's important that as we talk about conservation, we recognize how challenging that is. Um, uh, there were enormous ruptures to institutions throughout East Asia, but in particular in China, um, around the turn of the 20th century, um, which led to all sorts of uh, very interesting possibilities, but also huge challenges. The social, uh, the social uh, uh, position of people who identified as Confucians uh, shifts dramatically. If you talk about the middle of the 19th century, it's relatively easy to, uh, to identify uh, Confucians. Um, uh, if you move on, and they are in all walks of, uh, of life, certainly in China, but most prominently um, uh, in the civil service bureaucracy, which is still enormously um, uh, important at that time. Just a few decades later, that is gone. The civil service bureaucracy is gone. Um, uh, and if you want to identify a Confucian, the, your best bet is to look for somebody in a philosophy department in a research university that didn't exist just um, uh, a short period uh, before. So the category of philosophy, Joshua is new. These institutions are new. Um, uh, and the idea that Confucians are philosophers, right, uh, is itself new. So th that indicates there've been some, some enormous disruptions and changes. But that also means that there are new possibilities. Um, uh, I uh, sort of alluded already to the idea that uh, Confucianism uh, now comes to have a more clear uh, possibility of a, of a sort of a global life um, uh, as we move into the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, all sorts of interesting engagements with other philosophical traditions outside of those that uh, Confucianism already had been engaged with and so on. So the result, it seems to me, is the possibility of uh, progressive Confucianism um, emphasizing the ongoing development of the tradition, um, the uh, acceptance of the fact that modernity or disparate modernities have taken place. That's the ruptures that we're talking about. Um, but it's a critical acceptance. There's a lot of things that have come with modernity that are problematic, and Confucians should be um, should be critical of those problems. I've referenced already this idea that we need to uh, conserve the core values of the tradition. Um, obviously, that means that involves talking about what those core values are. And something that I haven't 
uh, talked about, but will come up uh, towards the end of my remarks this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are, morning here in the East Coast of the US, uh, is the deep relationship that uh, exists, I think, according to all Confucians, but it's very important to progressive Confucianism, between individual and, uh, and the collective. So the relationality that, that constitutes people um, uh, has, uh, I think, really profound consequences. Uh, for how we should be conceiving of our societies. Okay, that's part one. Part two, to talk about the idea of uh, starting points for moral growth. And I think that at the, uh, uh, essentially I'm gonna very briefly talk about three different standpoints that we see in the tradition those of Mengzi, Shunzi, and the Neo-Confucians, um, uh, and while acknowledging uh, that there are uh, genuine differences um, uh, between each of these uh, three views, um, uh, I think that there is a standpoint that can uh, coherently draw on the insights of each in, in a fairly uh, synthetic um, uh, and comprehensible way. Certainly Mengzi's viewpoint, um, uh, which is uh, that there are um, uh, naturally um, uh, incipient tendencies towards goodness in us, um, uh, tendencies that need to be nurtured, tendencies that we need to attend to in the right ways for them to grow more fully, um, but tendencies that are there, um, uh, in our nature, right? Uh, that I would say is the um, at the center of the way that I'm conceiving of this notion of starting points. Um, that is to say that as, uh, as, as humans seeking to grow morally, um, our first step is to start from what we already have. Um, uh, our first step uh, is not to uh, look to sort of artificially created frameworks outside ourselves, um, uh, but we have uh, some guidance, not enough, uh, but some guidance already uh, built into us. And I think that this idea is actually extremely plausible in a contemporary a sort of science aware um, uh, framework. Um, uh, the sorts of social emotions uh, that Mengzi refers to as the Sudwan, as the four sprouts, um, there's sure, certainly much work uh, that can be done um, uh, in, in the context of, uh, of modern science to further flesh out um, uh, sort of uh, what those are. are. Are there exactly those four or is there some other way to think about these, um, uh, these capacities that we have? Uh, but I think that there's a, a lot of insight here. At the same time, there are um, a lot of other ways in which, unless we work on ourselves very um, uh, intentionally, our, uh, our broader nature um, uh, can lead us astray. And that's, a, that's, of course, the central argument of Shunzi. So Shunzi doesn't, uh, uh, tends to neglect the idea, I think, um, that there is some nascent goodness within us. It seems to me that there simply is, um, uh, that the tendencies towards, um, uh, towards empathy, the ability to defer to others and thus learn from them and so on um, are uh, important parts of our nature. But Schrunz is clearly right, uh, that we have all sorts of uh, desires for things um, and that if we don't cultivate ourselves in the right way, those desires can take over and lead us astray. Uh, so, uh, so sure, we have we have uh, a lot to learn from Shunza, but Shunza, I think, has things uh, to to learn from a more sympathetic um, uh, engagement with with Mengzi. And then the Neo Confucians, um, the Neo Confucians, who see um, uh, a sort of implicit harmonious interdependence in the entire cosmos. Um, uh, and, and see that as in a certain sense already present in each of our natures and indeed the natures of all things. Um, it's a very expansive vision. Um, uh, one uh, that I think can be extremely inspiring. Um, uh, this insofar as Confucianism uh, in the contemporary world 
uh, is uh, inspiring to people in a uh, in a let's say a spiritual or religious way. It seems to me that neo-Confucian conceptualizations lie at the center of that. Um, and I confess to being uh, uh, quite drawn to some of these ideas, whether I think that they are literally true uh, of us in exactly the way in which someone like Zhu Xi uh, 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 believed. Well, um, uh, it's complicated and it depends on exactly how we interpret uh, Zhu Xi on some of, some of these uh, abstract ideas. Um, but I think that there's enough um, truth and inspiration that comes from the Neo-Confucian Neo way of thinking about our starting points and our ultimate goal uh, that uh, we, we would be mistaken as contemporary Confucians to, to sort of jettison uh, uh, all that the Neo-Confucian tradition developed over, over almost a millennium. Um, and indeed, I'll be drawing on Neo-Confucians uh, a little bit later in the talk, uh, and they come up in a variety of ways uh, throughout this book. Um, so Meng's at the center, but I think that there's a lot that we can, uh, that we can still draw from these other Confucian voices. So from this perspective then, uh, the result is uh, that we have these vital concerns for one another. Um, uh, and yet um, only if we work on ourselves, can we, as I put it here, become people who reliably answer to these concerns. Um, uh, so if you deny this about yourself, if you, you refuse to cultivate these potentialities, then you are um, uh, denying yourself. And this is an argument that, uh, that Mangsa makes. Um, so that seems to me to be right as far as it goes, but I do think it on its own fails as uh, being a sufficient motivation to do the work that's required to cultivate oneself. Um, uh, and so that's not, that's okay though, because I think there are a variety of other ways in which we can find motivation to cultivate oneself in the tradition. Um, many of these motivations can be divided into what I call pushes and pulls. So pushes are ways in which we feel unease at the manifest disharmony in the world. Um, we, uh, we feel badly when we recognize the many ways in which other people are suffering, in which there's dramatic inequality uh, and so on. Um, insofar as we attend to it and notice it, it pushes us to try to do something, including potentially insofar as you think about things this way, to do something to and with yourself and certainly to and with those who are close to you. So pushes are, uh, are one sort of motivation. Um, polls are more positive um, uh, rather than the sort of trying to get away from neg negativity uh, that pushes represent. Polls are being pulled towards positivity. And I think that we see um, uh, whether it's uh, with a group of friends one evening, with family um, home over holidays, um, uh, in one's professional uh, or academic context, um, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. There are these moments um, when we see the possibilities of a broader harmony, where we see things actually fitting together. Uh, and, we, and, and it's wonderful, it's joyful. Um, uh, so uh, this combination of pushes and pulls, I think, especially as we bring them further into um, explicit awareness, uh, can help to move us forward. Those are things that we are experiencing ourselves, um, uh, but this is in no way just an individualistic uh, conception of moral growth. Um, and uh, so there are a variety of ways uh, in which things outside of our immediate control um, help to reinforce these motivations. Um, uh, very important for Confucians are the way in which uh, well-designed, well-tuned rituals in a society help to do this. Um, uh, things that are taught by uh, one's elders, or one's family, uh, and so on in the first instance. Um, uh, and then other kinds of communal support. Um, here in the first instance, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about friends, classmates, 
um, uh, and so on, um, one's, one's uh, spouse and intimate family members. Um, there's a variety of ways in which we help and encourage one, on, one another um, uh, to pay attention to the, uh, the bad things and the good things in the world and the effects that is, uh, can have on ourselves. So the overall picture then is one of trying to always be moving closer to the very distant, perhaps possible to achieve, uh, but very distant ideal of, of sagehood. Um, uh, and what I wanna emphasize here is uh, that it doesn't matter really at all whether anyone is actually a sage. What matters is that each of us is trying to become better. Um, uh, and Confucians con uh, conceptualize this by articulating different stages of moral growth. Um, uh, in terms of the early Confucians, I think Shunz is the best at this, um, uh, at having um, a whole series of, uh, of, of stages of growth um, that show that there's always more that you can do but also demonstrating how far you've come, right? Um, it's important that even the uh, the Junzi, the Xianren, the Shengren, the, these you know these advanced stages of uh, of growth have fundamentally the same kinds of human concerns as anyone else, um, uh, and so uh, even a sage is not, in some uh, important way, discontinuous. Uh, in his or her concerns uh, with the rest of us. Uh, and I think that is, um, uh, that's an important part of understanding this as a, as a continuum of moral growth. Um, let's see, I think uh, I, I'd be happy to talk more about the, this idea of the possibility of sagehood. I think sagehood, it's important that sagehood is a human possibility. It's not important that it is extraordinarily rare um, uh, or, practically speaking, perhaps uh, uh, almost impossible. Um, but I think I don't wanna go on too long. So um, let me uh, then move on to part three. Um, so here is a list of some of the chapters of uh, this book, Growing Moral. Um, the first part of the book offers uh, some introduction, a little bit of historical overview, that kind of thing. Um, the second part of the book is uh, a look at different dimensions of, um, uh, of Confucian cultivation, um, uh, dealing with chap things like ritual, reading, music, reflection, reverential attention, socio-political engagement, and so on. So it is uh, looking at each of these uh, different things that one should do if one is to try to live a Confucian life. Part three of the book then looks sort of diachronically um, uh, at different phases or aspects of, uh, of moral growth, um, looking at the idea of the maturing of one's commitment to growth. Um, uh, the uh, chapter called Fake It Till You Make It, um, uh, looking at the way in which forced growth can lead to ever more spontaneous growth. Um, I talk about the way in which we don't deny the self as Confucians, but expand the self um, uh, and there's a chapter there dealing with, uh, with death um, and talking about the way in which, um, uh, as Amy Olberding puts it, uh, for Confucians, death is, death is a problem because it happens to other people. Um, uh, it's not so much one's own personal death uh, that, is, uh, that is important. And what I wanna do now for a few minutes is to drill down and focus on one of these uh, chapters, one of these dimensions of cultivation and uh, talk a little bit about reading. So here's a quote, the books you read should be embodied in your person. I don't know whether what you routinely study is on your mind at all times or not, but if it isn't, you're just hurrying through the texts, reading for their literal meaning and taking little pleasure in them. This I fear will be of no benefit to you in the end. So it seems to me uh, that that is something, it might seem a little stilted, uh, but that really is something that a lot of critics of teaching to the test in uh, the contemporary world could say, right? I think that, that, there, there, that is that idea uh, that what you're doing is you're just, you're just trying to um, uh, hurrying through so that you can do your best on the test. 
um, uh, but you're not taking the time to actually learn um, and, and allow the text to have the effect on you that, they're, that they are supposed to, right? I, I think that's a, a readily uh, accessible sort of sentiment. So uh, this was actually said by Jushi in the 12th century, talking about the civil service examination and people's preparation for, for those tests. Um, uh, but I think there, as I say, I think this is really in many ways a very contemporary sentiment. So with that as a uh, point of departure, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the kind of reading that Confucians, most explicitly Neo-Confucians, but I think I'm, 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 again, we can draw from the whole tradition here, um, uh, encourage us to undertake. So the Ming Dynasty Confucian Wu Yubi um, in his extraordinary, uh, extraordinary journal of his personal moral uh, journey, uh, um, talks about the way uh, in which he understands this approach to uh, reading. So in, in one passage, he writes, this evening, slowly walking through the fields, I was silently chanting passages from the doctrine of the mean. I took my time going over each word and phrase, chanting them with great feeling, realized in my heart mind, verified by my experience, this book has given me a great deal of insight. Um, uh, so if you think about the uh, the features of uh, the, the practice of reading and the effects that it's having, that Will You Be is describing here. Um, uh, I think this really is what Jushi has in mind. Um, it's repetitive. Um, uh, it's not just a quick read. Um, he's taking his time, going over each word and phrase. He's literally chanting them. In this case, silently, but at other times out loud. Um, uh, and so there's a, there's a ritual dimension to this practice, but it's not empty ritual, right? The, the words matter. He's looking for ways in which the words of this classic can be realized within him and verified in his experience. In, in, you know, in the terms of uh, contemporary younger people in the US, I think I first learned this, uh, this word um, uh, years ago from, from my kids. Um, Will You Be has, has, the, has made the text relatable. Um, uh, you know, it makes sense in terms of his own experiences in life. Um, uh, and as a result, it has given him insight. So, and I think insight, uh, inspiration, that's what uh, reading is supposed to be about. At the same time, we're supposed to read critically. Um, uh, and here we can find um, a wonderful example of that in Mengzi. So Mengzi 5A4, in explaining an ode, one should not allow the words to obscure the sentence nor the sentence to obscure the author's commitment. The right way to get it uh, is to use one's righteousness to meet the author's commitment. Um, uh, so what you're after is ultimately trying to find a way, you know, this is what it means to, for something to be relatable. You're trying to find a way in which the, uh, uh, the whole moral orientation, the moral commitment, that's that is implicitly there um, that the author of that uh, of that text had. You're supposed to try to find a way that your own um, uh, uh, sort of moral self can meet up with that and make friends, um, uh, find a common cause. And you, uh, it's important not to be misled, bogged down by the words or the sentences because ultimately what you're after is what's, uh, uh, what's behind those, right? And so I think this connects up with, with uh, Zhu Xi's repeated injunction that we should doubt what we read, um, uh, right? It isn't just a matter of reading in a sort of rigid way. Um, uh, if we can't come to the point of it making sense to us, um, uh, not just intellectually, but, but uh, affectively, emotionally, um, uh, then we have not succeeded in reading in the right way. So if we read <clears throat> in the way that Jushi recommends, um, uh, we go through these, uh, I, uh, we, you know, we can sort of systematize a little bit what he talks about into four steps of, first of all, familiarizing yourself with the text through recitation and then reflecting and questioning um, as that, be, becomes more successful, you get to the point of embodying it, um, uh, where the ideas and the text, uh, you have made them your own. And then ultimately you're able to go beyond the text, right? Jushi 
uh, says that ultimately book learning is secondary. It's not the most important thing. What's most important is how we live our lives, um, the kind of people that we become. Uh, and I think we can ask, um, and I'd love to talk about these questions with uh, with you all um, uh, if anybody wants to to return to this. But uh, you know, ask yourself: Do we ever actually read this way um, uh, in any context? And um, what particular texts should or could we read in this way? Are there are there limits? Is this is this uh, probably not the way that you should be reading mysteries or fantasy novels? Um, uh, but uh, but maybe I mean happy to happy to think about that. Um, uh, so is there a sort of content here? Jushi was in favor of reading everything, but he didn't think everything deserved the same kind of attention. Um, can this sort of reading be incorporated into classes in college, in high school, um, uh, in some way? And what would that be like, or in other ways, into our lives? And then what might be some of the challenges to reading in this way? So these. Uh, you know, sort of trying to give you a, a, a taste of how I think we should approach appropriating Confucianism in the contemporary world. We've got to uh, engage with the issues and ideas in the tradition, um, but then ask these sorts of questions in order really well to make it our own, um, to make it relatable uh, ourselves. Um, and I'm just going to refer very briefly to three different kinds of challenges. Um, uh, subjectivism would be the worry that this kind of reading involves just kind of finding in it whatever you find in it, um, uh, that it doesn't uh, sufficiently um, uh, actually sort of, uh, there's no objectivity, uh, that, that doesn't discipline you in any way, because since it's so much about making it relatable, well, you can do that anyway, uh, any way you want. That's one kind of concern. Another kind of concern, scholasticism, is that there's uh, almost a religion of reading here. Um, uh, so much focus on texts uh, that we lose the importance of lived reality. And then the third one is, is, is really getting back to what I was talking about in the previous slide, the challenges of institutionalization um, uh, of this sort of practice. So I think that these are, uh, are all real challenges. I think that Jushi certainly thinks that there is an important degree of objectivity involved in the kind of process that he's talking about. He does not think that we should be content with this with a sort of scholastic uh, approach. It's very clear, as I said, that he's ultimately interested in going beyond the text and he thinks that book learning is secondary. That's a quote. Um, uh, but I but you know that he says that doesn't necessarily make it true. So we have to think about these things. I think that as a first approximation, the kind of liberal education uh, that is uh, attempted in among other places, but I think uh, in the world today, fairly prominently in um, American liberal arts colleges, as different from large research institutions and so on, um, uh, bears at least a little bit of resemblance to the kind of education and reading practices uh, that I've been talking about. Um, uh, and it's not a perfect answer for sure, but it uh, is one way of bringing this into the contemporary world. And I have a quote here from Michael Roth, um, uh, who's the president of my university, Wesleyan University, in a book he wrote recently called Safe Enough Spaces, um, in which he's arguing that we need to go beyond mere critical thinking. So the quote is, in campus cultures where being smart means being a critical unmasker, students may become too good at showing how things can't possibly make sense. They may close themselves off from their potential to find or create meaning and direction from the books, music, and experiments they encounter in the classroom. So that's not 100% Jushi, but it seems to me to be, um, uh, you know, playing in the same sandbox, um, uh, uh, potentially in dialogue uh, with many of, of Jews' ideas. Uh, so, um, and I'm, uh, and then end this la this uh, penultimate section of the talk with one one brief anecdote. Um, when I first was teaching Jushi uh, in college, uh, teaching a course on Neo Confucianism, halfway through the semester, a student came up to me and, and uh, after class and said, "You know, Pre uh, Professor Angle." 
I just wanted to tell you that this class is the most relevant class that I'm taking in college. And I was rather surprised. <laughs> but, <laughs> Frankly, I was my initial reaction was that I was I was a little worried uh, that what well, what this said uh, about uh, the education that she was receiving, um, uh, you know, really twelfth century neo Confucianism was the was the most relevant thing. Um, but we talked a little bit, and it became clear that the the way in which we were using the concepts, categories, frameworks, and values from neo Confucianism. Um, uh, trying to, to learn what those were, but then trying to use them in applying them to our lives. I think in that, in that class, actually, I'd uh, uh, ask the students um, uh, to talk about a way that using the idea of Li, the pattern coherence, uh, um, we try to use that to help uh, understand a dispute they were having with a roommate. Um, uh, so it was, you know, and it worked pretty well um, uh, to, to, to think about things in that framework. But at any rate, this was the first time that this student had ever sort of systematically tried to work through more moral and normative issues um, uh, as they related to her own life. She hadn't had any kind of religious education where that might have been, uh, been uh, something. Um, uh, and so even though she wasn't like becoming a Confucian or a Neo-Confucian, um, uh, I think that she was finding a great deal of relevance to her own, what I would now say, moral growth. Um, uh, and so, uh, so that was great. Um, uh, that's, I, as I say, I'm sure that Jushi would still have some, uh, uh, some comments and criticisms uh, in, in terms of the way that we actually are undertaking liberal education. Uh, but there's enough in common, I think, to have, have a dialogue here. Alrighty, so um, I want to end by focusing on the way in which Confucianism is evolving or needs to evolve um, uh, in uh, in one more way. So the uh, let's see, I'm not going to spend very much time on this slide in light of time. Um, uh, essentially, this is just um, some more ways of thinking about the fact that Confucianism needs to always be an, uh, an evolving living tradition. Um, uh, and thus, folks participating in the Confucian tradition um, uh, need to be involved in doing what Feng Yulan calls uh, jie zhe jiang, that is continuing the tradition, rather than simply following it, art, um, uh, articulating what has happened in the past, even though that's closely related. Um, uh, but. Uh, at any rate, and we could talk about, well, who decides what an appropriate um, development of the tradition is. Um, uh, but I wanna give one concrete example here. Uh, and that is the way in which it seems to me contemporary Confucians must be involved in critiquing gender oppression. Um, uh, the, this is notwithstanding the fact that I think it's uncontroversial that the mainstream view throughout the tradition, particularly the last thousand years of the tradition, but go, going back even further than that, um, uh, is that women were distinctly limited in their ability to develop morally. And many, many, many Confucians explicitly said that, Confu that women cannot become sages. Um, uh, there is the uh, limitation of women to the inner sphere, um, uh, the household, um, uh, and the conceptualization of new de, of female virtues, distinct from uh, the, the virtues uh, that you might've thought applied to everybody. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, there are all, there's a lot one can say about this, uh, but I think in general, it's quite clear that, that the, the dominant view in the tradition um, uh, until recently at least uh, has been um, limiting the, the possibilities of women. Now there are importantly are um, uh, uh, sort of discordant voices um, uh, over the in the tradition that disagree with this mainstream view. Uh, and one important example, um, the Ming Dynasty Empress Ren Xiaowen, uh, in her nation, one hundred percent clearly argues that women have the same human nature, can develop the same virtues as men, and can be can therefore become sages. 
um, uh, so disagreeing with many of her male predecessors and contemporaries. Nonetheless, even Ren Xiaowen's vision is still uh, uh, limited in, a, in, in one important way, uh, in that she thinks that the development of uh, benevolence, righteousness, uh, propriety, wisdom, uh, and so on, um, those can uh, those are open to women, but not but only in their uh, the mode of being an inner helpmate. So that the uh, limitation to the inner sphere um, uh, is still in place for uh, for the empress. Um, and so it seems to me that the idea that women are somehow different from men in what they can achieve morally has absolutely no grounding. Um, uh, and there's no good reason to think this in terms of uh, any, frankly, any point in the Confucian tradition. There are people who say it, but there's no good reason for it. Um, uh, it seems like the explanation uh, is pretty clearly a set of assumptions about patriarchy um, uh, that um, are uh, and and a set of, of of practices that are that are in place, changing practices. It's not a you know gender relations is not a uh, just a sort of fixed and, and consistent thing in in, uh, in China, um, but a set of assumptions that are then sort of uh, uh, rationalized through the lens of Confucian language. Um, uh, but without any kind of deep-seated Confucian justification. Um, my graduate school friend, um, Xinyi Chan, uh, who was for, for many years taught at the Univers uh, University of uh, Vermont, um, uh, wrote a terrific essay uh, a couple decades ago, arguing that the conception of gender that one finds in classical Confucianism has no deep justification um, in classical Confucianism. I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, and one can develop this, this argument um, uh, in a whole variety of ways. Um, the upshot is, it seems to me, that modern progressive Confucians need to endorse um, uh, a full uh, kind of gender equality. Um, uh, that's the only thing uh, that really makes sense of uh, both what we know, um, uh, you know, sociologically, uh, scientifically, and so on, and again, what is there in the texts, the, uh, the, the, the ideas and values that are, that are at the center of Confucianism. Admittedly, um, that doesn't mean that everybody is exactly the same and that relationships are uh, sort of, um, uh, that everyone's relationship with everyone else is exactly the same. That's not true of anybody. Um, uh, there's a lot of difference and diversity um, uh, and change over time. Uh, and uh, so within a, uh, a family, people might um, uh, play different roles at different times. That is exactly what we should expect from any tradition that takes its, uh, its departure in some ways from a text like the I Ching, right? The I Ching, it seems to me, encourages uh, a, uh, a continually dynamic, diverse view of, um, uh, of things like uh, gender and also all all sorts of relationships, right? It seems to me that the natural way to develop the I Ching uh, when it comes to questions of gender is in fact to think about things like um, uh, uh, gender fluidity, um, uh, non-binary gender, um, right? I mean, those are just so easy to see uh, as um, uh, as ideas that are that are uh, compatible, even encouraged by the. Uh, uh, by the I Ching. So I think there's a lot of, uh, of interesting work that contemporary Confucians um, uh, can and should be doing around this topic, uh, but I am about out of time. So I'm just gonna end, here are three questions um, uh, that I ask and, and think about towards the end of the book um, uh, that I'll, I'll leave you with. Um, I feel like I have answers to these questions uh, that at least partly satisfy me. Um, uh, but, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing is, uh, you know, not without controversy. Um, uh, and so I think that it's interesting to think about this uh, effort to, to create a new Tao Tong um, and uh, draw on a variety of, of different Confucian thinkers in this way. Um, 
the talk that I've given this today, any, at any rate, whatever, whatever, where, whatever time it is where you are, um, uh, um, purposely is emphasizing texts uh, because I think one potential uh, worry about this contemporary approach to Confucianism can be that it, it downplays too far the role of textual scholarship. But I don't think the textual scholarship is at the core of Confucianism in the way that the second question uh, suggests. And then there's a couple other things here. I hope it's not just a hodgepodge of Western ideas dressed up in Confucian clothing. Um, but let me end here. Uh, thank you so much. And I very much look forward to the comments and uh, the conversation. OK, thanks, Stephen. Uh, thanks, Professor Stephen, for the lectures. So next, we will have two commentators to make their comments on Angle's lecture. So first, I will introduce our first commentator, Lisa Indrakakwa. I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> uh, because she still has courses later after the lecture, so we will let her to make comments first. So actually, this is also my first time to meet with Lisa, uh, so nice to meet you. I, I think many friends here, just like me, wants to know more about her. So before her comments, I will briefly introduce her first. Lisa is Associate Professor of Chinese Studies at Tallinn University in Estonia. She got her PhD from CA Foscaria University of Venice with a thesis on the early Chinese sophistic persuader Gong Sunlong. Um, she has already worked many years in the University of Zurich as a postdoc researcher, and she was also very active in the relative research activities between Asia and Europe. Um, she has many publications, and the most of them about the Chinese logicians or the topic about the use of paradoxes and language joke in early Chinese texts and so on. Um, and this is also her main research interest, like the early Chinese thought, uh, the classical, the warring states philosophical literature, the classical Chinese rhetoric, and so on. So now she is vice president of the European Association for Chinese Studies, and also uh, one of the affiliated member of the Zurich Center for the Study of the Ancient World. Um, so according to the above introduction, we can say that actually Lisa has already worked on classical Chinese philosophy for many years. And so really look forward to her comments on Engel's project. So next I will give time to Lisa. Lisa, please. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for this wonderful talk that I really enjoyed and somehow integrated the notes that I'd taken before. Uh, so, um, first of all, I'm really grateful for this book that you've written because uh, I, I myself a few years ago, I remember as my Facebook status when uh, it was about political views, I put myself as being a Confucian, which raised a lot of controversy, of course. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for this book that you've written because it really interprets the spirit of Confucianism as I myself has tried to somehow embody it or try to live it out in my own life. So focusing especially on the values rather than all kind of superstructure that it might or might not have been part of the original thought and actually have developed far away from what might have been uh, ever meant by Confucius. So I think it's really important to go to Fan Ben somehow, go back to the roots and really look at what is the real message here? What, is, what was so important? Even if, of course, we can agree to a certain extent to certain criticism that also other trends of thought had that they were focusing sometimes maybe stressing too much the rituals or uh, one of my questions will be about erudition precisely or education as you mentioned in your last slide. But what was the real, the real goal, of course, and how to reach it? And uh, I, I somehow myself always question uh, myself when, when I think, thinking about this quotation from uh, the Lu Yu that I always have in my mind, like every day examine myself in three aspects, have I been loyal, have I been trustworthy to friends, 
uh, and have I somehow embodied what I've been uh, what has been transmitted to me from the Suear. And this is something that I think this is the real spirit of Confucianism. But I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I want to move on to uh, a few questions that I have for you. Well, some are questions, some probably are more like cues for or food for thoughts or some uh, further discussion might be interesting to have because of course there's limited space in a book and I'm sure we could I would like to hear more about what you think about some of these issues. Um, so uh, first of all, let me get my notes. Um, well, I love the discourse that you also made uh, now in your presentation about the importance of reading, uh, and especially the, the tr because we know that this meaning of hua, of jiao hua, of transformational power, well, or, or wen, or jiao, that is so central in Confucianism and this idea of a, of a reading that is not just a passive kind of like, you know, I don't know, suffering or enduring the book, but really engaging with the book, having a conversation with the book somehow. Uh, so it, this is something that I think is so important to stress. And I really try also to, to explain to my student that it's not just lear that learning by heart is not such a dry exercise, but it can really have also some more deeper insight eventually coming out of it. Uh, I really loved also the idea of the continual moral growth, which is exactly what is at the basis of the process of self-cultivation, which is uh, even if we know, okay, it's not so explicitly addressed, maybe not in, di in the dialogues, but then it becomes more central. Uh, so the idea that, the, that it's not a sclerotic, kind of thought that is just repeating what has been going on for centuries, but it's actually very much in motion. And I think it's uh, your contribution is very important to stress the fact that it should somehow this process has been slowing down uh, in the last ages and that we should find a way to fuel up this process to put Confucianism back into motion also with the times, because adjusting to the times eventually was also what Confucius was saying. He wasn't just saying, of course, we have to preserve tradition, but we just don't always have just to think that we are still in the shadows, right? So I think this is a very important uh, task for the future to get in Chinese philosophy to really re relatable, exactly as you mentioned, to, to contemporary people, as much as it is so obvious for us, maybe we can somehow you know, exude our love for this tradition and make it also appealing to others. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes less, but maybe it's it's a worth enterprise. Uh, I also like the fact that, uh, I think this was more in your book, but you touched upon briefly also in your presentation, this idea of, for instance, of the extreme segregation of the sexes or certain kind of also gender distinction. This has more to do with tangential traditions than really what was the original meaning of Confucianism. I can't stress this enough when I teach. Uh, it does always pass it through as a message, but it's really a combination of different uh, things that eventually have been known or acknowledged as being Confucian, uh, but they're more Confucianist than Confucian in a certain way. Uh, so I really like that you stress this. Um, but I will move on to my questions because otherwise we go on talking the whole day. So one relatively short question, but it could lead to more uh, thought, thinking is, I was really thinking when I was read, reading, especially the last part of your text about the gender, especially chapter, about the role of eunuchs, because it's, this is something that I've been asking myself recently because it's a bit hard to somehow reconcile it. It seems so natural that eunuchs are there for centuries, but they're really problematic from different aspects. Uh, so this is something I have been asking myself, like how do we reconcile it so easily that nobody really seems to question these hybrid kind of fi figures uh, that are in the liminal space. And it's not only allowed, but it's actually a common practice and institutionalized practice. So this is something that I'm very curious to learn more about. Um, then, uh, of course, the, this idea of education. Uh, well, or, or at least the um, traditional Confucian way of putting so much stress on 
learning in the sense of also a kind of learning that it's elitarian. So elitarianism, and how do you reconcile the elitarian aspects that are still there uh, in traditional Confucianism with what could be a more engaging, a more live way to uh, somehow perform or leave Confucianism? This is somehow, because of course, in the past, you also had a teacher, of course. I mean, here instead, we find mostly in a situation in which someone engages with the text on their own, uh, largely, but not always maybe, but uh, for most of the time, uh, but it's still something that it is not so accessible for everyone. So this is something that we should find a way to somehow break down or, or debunk in a way, because of course uh, it is very much there, this uh, almost this love for learning, but it's also a very elitarian aspect to it. Something that you also raise uh, is uh, the discourse about meritocracy, which I think is fascinating. And I would have liked to, to read more in the book, but of course, again, space is limited. But uh, I think what is not so obvious and that we give for granted, uh, the fact that democracy, uh, a democratic process is not necessarily a meritocratic process. And in the West, we tend to think that the two things basically are the same or overlap, or in any case that meritocracy is democratic, which is actually not quite the case instead, if we think of a meritocracy also uh, as it's conceived in contemporary political thought in China, for instance. So I think this is an aspect that I would have liked to, to read more about because you mentioned it, and uh, but it's a huge topic. So I understand why you didn't like went more about it, but I think it would be very important because I think in the West, there's this uh, tendency to somehow um, identify the two or think that the two are basically consistent somehow. Um, okay, and then I totally agree about this idea that somehow a new uh, or a progressive Confucianism should also tackle this idea of the uh, gender inequality. Um, I've translated some of the chapters of the nation also, and uh, it's it's very interesting, of course. And uh, in the imperial period, you see very fantastic women actually showing, displaying a whole kind of also literacy and erudition. And we go back to the fact that um, we have this, of course, this is a very controversial sentence attributed to Confucius in the dialogues, which is also very disputable whether Confucius ever said anything like that. Uh, that women are somehow difficult to talk to, but that's the closest that you get to ever having a negative comment. But I mean, Confucius sometimes is just angry or frustrated and also has doesn't restrain himself when talking to his disciples. So he might have had just a bad day. Um, but I, I'm thinking, but then, for instance, he engages with Lady Nanza, which is always also raises concern among his disciples. So it's already ambiguous there, and it actually already leaves more room for the fact that he thinks that Lady Nanzo is worth talking to. So I think that already that hints to the fact that is there really this difference? I, I, I totally agree with you that there's no reference that I can think of where it's explicitly stated that women cannot possibly develop the first sprouts or uh, be moral or um, uh, engage in self-cultivation, for instance. Uh, of course, we always find a body of text that is written by sc male scholars addressing mostly a male audience. But this is more a limitation of what are the times, of course, that we have to think of. Um, but it, I mean, we also extend uh, moral values to animals at a certain point also when we get to Neo-Confucianism. So, I mean, there, there's really no such strong uh, position towards women also. So I totally agree with you that somehow we can, by going back maybe to some more original, if we can uh, very loosely use the term for conception of Confucianism, actually tackle or being more modern if we are, if we want to, and being able to tackle or to get into conversation also with contemporaneity in a very more, very productive way. I'll stop here so that I don't go over time. And thank you so much anyway for the talk and for the reading. Yes, thanks, Lisa. So Professor Stephen, do you want to respond now? I think, um, uh, Lisa, if you need to, to leave to, to teach, then maybe I should uh, just at least make a few brief responses. Uh, <laughs> uh, and 
Um, but you you know you open up some some wonderful topics that we could we could talk for a long time about. But just uh, a few brief brief things. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think that the among many other things, I'd love to talk more about the sort of the fascinating kind of awkward experience of a, coming to identify oneself as a Confucian um, uh, outside of an East Asian context. Um, uh, I think for me, it's been sort of gradually growing over over years of of uh, uh, starting to wonder about if you know, does that actually make sense, and then in, in, and then in kind of diffidently, you know, in certain contexts, beginning to um, uh, to try that out, uh, and and then increasingly being willing to sort of just say it out loud in any context, um, uh, but the uh and you know there are different sorts of challenges that come from saying um to friends in you know middletown connecticut in the us that i'm a confucian um as opposed to say uh talking with colleagues and friends in china and saying you know uh you know what's your <laughs> uh and uh you know that's uh um, anyways, lots of interesting things around that. Um, one of the things that it, in, in reflecting on this, uh, it seems to me that's relevant is because of the enormous ruptures and disruptions that took place in, in China and more broadly in East Asia around the turn of the 20th century, um, uh, I think that even for contemporary Chinese people to identify themselves as Confucian is in a certain way vexed. Um, it's uh, and so that helps. <laughs> uh, I almost think that identify what it is to identify as a modern Confucian is a bigger question than what it is to identify as a American or European Confucian. Um, uh, but it, it, you know, it's sort of uh, because it's it's such a such a question. It opens up possibilities. Um, uh, and uh, anyways, I'd love that. So I'm, I'm glad you raised that and uh, I'm, I'm fascinated to, to hear more. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, a, a bunch of other uh, really interesting things on, on meritocracy and democracy, right? The whole set of other issues. Um, uh, and I, in the, in growing moral, I, I don't get into political philosophy and, you know, social political issues very much, um, uh, but they're, they're very important. And I, I agree with that and, and uh, have, am, have continued to be interested and work on, work on those, those questions. I think you're right uh, that democracy and meritocracy aren't straightforwardly uh, consistent, but I think there are ways in which we can try to um, uh, bring them together as much as possible. Um, uh, but so that's a, that's that could be a whole whole long conversation. The two things that you said that I'm most intrigued by um, are uh, one the question of how you reconcile the uh, sort of uh, elitist side of Confucianism uh, with uh, broader education, with education for all. Um, and yeah, that's great. I don't think I had kind of put that question to myself in in, in exactly that way, um, uh, but. The thing that immediately occurred to me is, um, uh, so I've been teaching a class together with two colleagues um, over the last, uh, we just just finished uh, for this, the third time now, so over the last three years, um, called Living a Good Life. Um, uh, and it's a course that sort of, um, it fits in with the broader uh, sort of trend or movement um, that, that, that people are calling philosophy as a way of life. Um, uh, and both drawing on ancient philosophical traditions, um, uh, but also on the the practices or uh, that were recommended in these in these traditions, and having students engage not just with text but also engage in these philosophical exercises. Um, uh, and I will just in case anybody is interested in this. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Where did the chat go? Um, so, uh, in fact, livingagoodlife.com is the uh, the website uh, for the these courses uh, that my colleagues wow. and I have been teaching, um, and uh, all of the material is on is on the web there. Uh, 
the what we're going to be doing next semester, and this is uh, spearheaded by a former student who took the class and then had worked as a what we call a dialogue facilitator um, uh, in the class, uh, and is now we've hired her. Um, she is developing a sort of pared down version of this to teach in local high schools. Um, uh, and so that, you know, when you're asking about how to, you know, broaden out, certainly Wesleyan is an elite liberal arts college that, uh, uh, you know, is, is a, a, a nice example of this elitism, <laughs> for better and for worse. But Middletown High, not so much. Um, uh, and so I think that if, if this is successful, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see whether it 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 meets a a, a need, whether there's a response among among the students, um, but anyways, lots of you know it's a good theoretical question, but also something we should be working practically on. Uh, and then finally, I just want to turn this eunuch question back to you. Uh, that's uh, that's great. I've never thought about eunuchs in this context at all, and I guess what I'm mostly interested in is um, what sort of what's 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 lying behind the question. Um, uh, and in particular, when you're talking about the liminal space and these hybrid figures, is the suggest and and their acceptance by society. So, is the suggestion that this is some evidence for uh, more of an openness to sort of non-binary gender ideas of, of of a kind? Is that is that what you had in mind, or is there a different kind of question? I was wondering, actually, because in a certain way, it seems to neutralize what are the more extreme aspects of femininity and masculinity and eunuchs are men, but are not really men. So they can enter, they, they go back and forth. So also this idea of nay, why, and basically mediating the spaces and, and it's fantastic. So it's somehow like beyond both. And I don't know, I'm just thinking about Bodhisattvas and the fact that also they, they are they can do anything basically so and the fact that this is not a problem so it's more of a problem for us like thinking for a sudden that they don't fit somehow in all these nice system in which we have the feminine the masculine yin and yang and all this nay why and all the division of roles and they somehow seem to be the kind of element that makes it problematic but it isn't because somehow it seems like they lose uh, but they reconcile really the two aspects and in that way they're not they are not problematic they seems to be not problematic and uh, I, I really have to think more about it because it's something that pop up in class and I was thinking it is true that they, they are something that goes beyond and there is no problem with it they are perfectly part of the institutionalized system they are uh actually very available members of staff and uh, as long as they don't somehow act like men then engaging in relationship I mean at least officially engaging in relationship with women then they're fine so this this is something very very interesting that I've never really reflected upon but it's something that I think deserves more attention yeah yeah thank you thank you okay thank well, you so great. much and, yep. thank you uh, I think that there's uh, I think that's that's terrific. And the uh, Sini Chan, my uh, who I mentioned, has written a wonderful essay about homosexuality um, uh, uh, in uh, in the Confucian tradition uh, that I also would recommend. You know, I mean, there's a sense in which the I Ching should suggest that there should be at least 64 different kinds of gender expression. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, so um, so who knows? But uh, I think there, this is a an interesting topic uh, that could be explored in a lot of ways. So, so super, thank you so much. And uh, maybe we should move on to the other commentator. Okay, so thanks, Angel. And also thanks, uh, Lisa. If you have to leave, you can just go, okay? Uh, so next we will introduce the other commentator, Professor Feng Xudong from East China Normal University. So Professor Feng, uh, got his PhD, a PhD degree from Peking University in 2001. And after that, he has worked as a postdoc in Renmin University of China for one year. Uh, he has visited many uh, universities like Harvard University in 2006 and Oxford University in 2009, Kyoto University from us uh, in 2015. And now currently, 
He is also the fellow of Confucianism Institute in Peking University, and also the fellow of Shanghai Institute for Research of Confucianism in Fudan University. Uh, she, uh, he is also a standing director of the Confucius Society of China, the Zhuxi Society of China, and the Shanghai Confucianism Society. He's also a member of the Chinese Philosophical History Society. So he has lots of members of this kind of sense. Um, Professor Fang has published many books, nearly 100 papers in very good journals like Philosophical Research, Oriental Journal, Dao, and other professional journals, uh, not only in English, but also in Chinese. So we can find lots of his books and not only in English, but also in Chinese. And in, among the books he has published, one of them is about the painting comes after the plain groundwork, the interpretations and the philosophical studies of the classics. So we can say here it focuses on the uh, explanations or our understanding of the classical uh, uh, text. So I think maybe this is connected with our topic here today, how to look at the text in our modern world. So we really look forward to Professor Fang to his comments on Professor Steve's lectures. So next I will give time to Professor Fang, please. 好的,谢谢那个积分的介绍 最快速的了解他的这个书的一个方法。那么里面谈到的议题也很多，呃，因为我自己本人呢，最近几年在啊做自己的这样的一些研究，就是所谓的叫分析儒学（analytic confucianism）。所以在很多方面，我觉得跟呃Stephen教授的这个。研究和这个观点有很多这个相近和这个共同感兴趣的地方。比如说那个Stephen教授讲到要对这个传统有一些这个转换。然后特别是讲到这个对当代的这些议题要有一些回应。那么这个也是我自己在我的这个分析儒学
当我们谈到那个呃宋代这个 New Confucian 的时候呢，我们很清楚的知道，它相对于那个 Classical Confucian 或者 Ancient Confucian 呢，它有一些新的地方啊、呃，比如说按照牟宗三的这个概括啊、呃、，According to Professor 牟宗三啊、呃，他就会说啊、呃，这个宋代的这个 New Confucian， 他关注的这个啊、呃、议题 topic 不太一样。啊，比如说他会关注很多 metaphysical 的这样的一些问题，啊啊，比如说像周敦颐啊、朱熹，他就会讨论这个太极、理气这样一些问题，而这些是古代儒学啊不太关注的问题。那么另外一方面呢，呃，尤其是这个 New Confucian 的，他可能会呃对古代的这个经典也有自己的选择，比如说他会。啊，更加强调 four books， 而不是 five 啊 classics。那么这些呢，还还有诸如此类的吧。就是呃，当我们说宋啊 New Confucian 的时候呢，我们会举出一些啊、呃、特点来讲，它跟古代的这个儒学是有一些不一样。所以我想第一个问题就是说，呃 ，Steven 教授，当你提出来这个 progressive 的这个进步儒学的时候，就相当于。啊、uh, ，traditional confusion， 啊、uh, ，您的这个进步主要体现在什么方面？比如说你拓展了呃哪些 topics， 又或者说你比较关注于啊、uh, 在儒学史上哪些这个啊呃儒家的这个，比如说 philosopher 啊，比如说呃、uh, 是不是你对呃呃呃宋代的这个关注的这些？呃，比如说像孟子啊或者孔子之外，你有新的关注，比如说你会强调啊、呃，比如说这个啊、呃、荀子啊，我我我这是随便举,举例子啊，又或者说你会关注，比如说宋代的啊、呃，比如说叶氏啊，诸如此类的，就是说跟传统的这些主流的啊呃,呃这个 confusion 啊、呃，您的这个 progressive 的这个，应该我想有一些自己的新的这个 emphasis。所以这这个问题啊，希望您能够跟我们再做一些介绍。另外一个就是一个非常具体的问题，因为您提到这个性别的话题，啊，就是呃呃 ，topic of 呃呃 gender， 呃，实际上这个问题呢，我自己也比较感兴趣。而且你里面刚才那个 PPT 里面，你也提到了一个啊，这个古代儒家关于那个性别的一个基本的观点，比如说这个啊，男主外。啊，女主内，对吧？那么，呃，我就是很想知道，当你讲这个 progressive 的这个啊 confusion， 你可不可以以这个性别的这个议题做一个例子，向我们具体的演示一下？因为刚才限于时间，我想你没有啊充分展开，就是啊，在这个议题上，就关于这个啊 gender 的这个议题上。您跟那个你坚持了儒家传统的什么样子的一个观点？但同时呢，你又做了新的这样的一个 development， 就是如果你坚持了儒家的观点，那么这个观点是什么？是呃，依然是男主外女主内吗？还是说，因为我注意到你有一个叫做 full gender equality， 那么这个 full gender equality。呃，可以被认为是 confusion 的这样的一种啊呃,呃 principle 吗？因为如果按照这个 confusion 的话，这个男和女是不是可以说这个 equal 是平等的？呃，所以在这个议题上，你可不可以具体的再说明一下？就是您的进步儒学呢？呃，坚持了儒学的什么呃原则，同时呢又发展了什么原则啊？我很想听到您这方面的，就是两个问题吧。啊，谢谢。嗯。Thanks, Professor Fang. So, Professor Steven, maybe you can respond now. Okay. 也也可能记分你你，因为我刚才全部是用中文，是不是有些那个听众他需要用英文给他再讲一下？ <laughs> so I'm going to、uh, I'm going to respond in English, so I can summarize maybe the questions、okay. that you asked,、um, yeah. and then、okay. respond. Um, uh, 
And uh, how about that? Um, so thank you so much, Professor Fong. Um, and uh, uh, I'm a little bit familiar with the uh, fancy uh, that you have been developing, <laughs> but I think I need to I need to read more um, uh, because it's always it's it's always good to find uh, allies <laughs> and friends. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so that so I'm really uh, grateful that you. Uh, are, have taken the time to, to engage uh, with my work uh, today. Um, uh, you, um, uh, you emphasized, uh, I think, two different topics, two different questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one having to do with uh, the, the, the idea of progressive Confucianism, um, uh, progressive, what is it compared to? Um, uh, how, does yes. it, how does it differ from other forms of Confucianism? Uh, and as you pointed out, uh, with earlier developments of the tradition, um, uh, like Song Dynasty, Neo-Confucianism, um, uh, it's quite clear that they are uh, developments with respect to um, earlier classical Confucianism. Um, uh, and uh, introducing new topics, new emphasis on metaphysics and uh, emphasizing different texts, uh, the, the, the four books uh, instead of the five classics and so on. So that's, we understand what's new about Neo-Confucianism. Um, and presumably we could say the same thing about 20th century new Confucianism. We know what's new about that. They're engaged with, with, with Kant and Hegel um, uh, and, uh, and so on, and with topics like democracy, um, uh, right? So, the, uh, uh, um, so, so what about progressive Confucianism in this regard? Um, one thing I would say is I think that the, uh, the category of uh, new or neo-Confucianism, uh, just Xin Ruxue, Right. That's a that seems to be a term that can be used again and again. Almost every era has its Xin Ruxue, uh -huh. um, uh, even though that word really only uh, took on prominence in the 20th century. Um, uh, I uh, I think that it's it's too general for it. I, I felt that it was too general for me to use because it could mean so many different things. Um, but there's a sense in which uh, what I'm calling progressive Confucianism is uh, very similar to what we mean when we say Xin Wu Xue. Um, uh, that it, so just as you say, it's, it's gotta be new in certain respects, but also the same in other respects. There, not, there needs to be this continuity um, uh, with the past. Um, so I guess, I would say uh, that um, one of the central things about progressive Confucianism uh, is its relationship with modernity. Um, uh, and <laughs> modernity is also a tricky word where in principle, you might, you might have had people, so modernity means something, it's related to time. Right, it's related to mm -hmm. the new things that are happening now, um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, in in some sense, you could say that even Song Dynasty Neo Confucianism is grappling with the new issues of its time. Um, yeah. uh, right, there are have been a, a very large social and political changes in the Song Dynasty that um, the the Neo Confucians um, uh, were responding to. So the same the same thing is uh, is is true today, but the content of the changes obviously are very different. Um, uh, so the um, uh, political changes, social developments, the development of of modern science, um, uh, and you know uh, the uh, the development of <clears throat> global capitalism um, uh, and um, I would add the uh, challenges of climate change, right? All of these things that are shaping our world today um, uh, are um, uh, central to uh, progressive Confucianism today. I think progressive Confucianism could be used in 200 years 
you could use the same category um, uh, because part of the idea is simply to emphasize that the, tr that the tradition is in a continual process of development. Um, uh, the, um, the other reason that I like the word progressive Confucianism um, uh, is because it speaks to something that I think is always true of Confucianism, but is not very present in our discourse today, um, uh, which is this idea of the importance of personal and social progress, right? Moral progress. Um, the idea that we have to strive to become better. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, that is at the heart of Confucianism. Um, uh, and thinking about how that can be emphasized and realized today, uh, that our, uh, our societies should be designed in such a way as to um, increase the uh, moral progress um, uh, of all citizens, of all the inhabitants. Um, that's not the way that liberals talk. That's not the way that most conservatives uh, talk, at least here in the United States. Um, uh, and so I think this idea of progress is, is reorienting uh, in, in an important sense. More specifically, in answer to your question about the uh, what figures and texts are important, um, uh, I think that part of what is unusual about what I'm doing is trying to both pay attention to the classical figures, Mengzi, of course, first, but also Xunzi, uh, Kongzi as well, um, and the Neo-Confucians. Um, uh, so I think that there are, are uh, um, you know, in, in contemporary Confucianism, there are some people who think we should, it's really the classical figures who got, who got it right, and the, and the later Confucians go wrong. There are some people who really emphasize Neo-Confucianism. There are others who think that, that the Han Dynasty Confucianism and the institutions and so on developed then are what uh, the most relevant. Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm striving to, I don't want to lose Neo-Confucianism. I think there's just so much value, um, uh, in the insights and the practices, uh, of Neo-Confucianism. Uh, so, uh, there's a, an effort to maybe be more encompassing, more inclusive, um, uh, um, that, uh, that is going on, um, it's also the case uh, that for me, uh, Mo Zhongshan and uh, his way of thinking about politics uh, is very important, um, uh, which is also certainly um, uh, controversial. But so anyway, so there's a this idea of of a, of a Dao Tong that there are you know some a uh, whole range of figures that I think are most relevant to thinking about Confucianism today, um, that most enables us to. Uh, understand the possibilities for our moral progress. Um, so that's a partial answer maybe to your first question. Uh, your second question, uh, Professor Fong said that, that he's also interested in this question of gender. Um, uh, and I think had a nice challenge, uh, uh, namely, um, so what Confucian views do I agree with when I'm talking about gender? It sounds like, full gender equality is yeah you didn't you didn't say you were you were not so sort of you didn't say put it this way but it's it sounds like that might be not confucian at all <laughs> um uh and uh so in what sense is the account of gender that i'm offering a confucian account at all and why isn't it just um you know disconnected um and i guess the so one answer i would say is in keeping with uh, Ren Xiaowen, uh, the uh, with the with the nation, my emphasis is on the uh, the commonality of all people, right? Um, uh, so I think that we need to critique traditional Confucian assumptions about gender for Confucian reasons. That is. <laughs> 
if Confucians think that all people can develop to become a sage, and if Confucians think that all people have natures that are partly made up of uh, Ren um, uh, then we then we should be sure that all people, including women, have the ability to develop those virtues and have the ability to become a sage. We should not design our societies in ways that put barriers to some people, women, and not other people, men, um, uh, in their moral development. So it seems like a, if a Confucian is committed to universal human nature, which they all should be, then they should also think that our social institutions and political institutions should give everyone an equal chance of developing that human nature. Um, uh, and I think that the, uh, the actual uh, institutions and practices related to gender in Chinese society mostly failed that test. Um, now that said, um, uh, when I say full gender equality, I don't mean that everyone is simply the same in all respects. Um, I mean that politically, people should have equal status. Um, socially, people should have equal opportunities. Um, but it doesn't mean that everybody has to do exactly the same things. Um, uh, the, that's where I mentioned the Yijing um, uh, because, right, the, there are 64 different hexagrams always transforming from one into another, right? Uh, and um, and that's, only a, 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 that's only one way in which the Yijing uh, encourages us to think um, in terms of dynamic patterns of change. Um, and so I have one essay in which I write about uh, the uh, relations between spouses. Uh, between um, so I think that the fu fu you be is I think that's a problem. I think it's a problem to emphasize be uh, in the in the relationship between the between spouses um, uh, because it becomes too fixed. Um, uh, but you know th that doesn't mean that each spouse needs to do exactly the same things and play the same roles. It might be that in some contexts, uh, one plays a bigger role in child rearing and another plays a bigger role in another respect and that that can change over time. And it doesn't have to always be a man and a woman doing those things. In, in, uh, um, I see very little reason to resist um, uh, uh, gay marriage. Um, uh, uh, very very little reason in fact no reason to to, to resist and as I as I as I said uh, to uh, to Lisa I think that there's there's it's really quite an open conception of gender um, uh, if you go back you know if you go back to the Yijing and if you go back to this idea that everybody's nature is fundamentally the same um, uh, what grows out of that um, I think can go in a lot of different directions um, that that does mean, uh, abandoning a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of specific practices and assumptions um, uh, uh, that were traditional. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say here is, I think that in some ways, uh, traditional Confucian political arrangements were um, uh, good, but ultimately very limited. So the idea that the ruler has to pay attention to the well-being of the people um, uh, in order to be a legitimate ruler. Um, that's a better idea than the European idea that the ruler's legitimacy comes from God um, and cannot be challenged by, by people, right? So the, the Confucian political ideal seems like it is pretty good but it's not as good as a more open political system that doesn't have a monarch and subjects. <laughs>
Um, I think that we could say the same thing perhaps about the traditional Confucian gender system where there is a, uh, it could have been worse, <laughs> uh, right? There, there, there is a degree to which um, uh, women are, uh, have certain levels of responsibility and agency within the family, right? Within the household. Um, uh, and there is some emphasis on women's abilities to grow, but it, even though it could have been worse, it still is very limited. Um, uh, and so I think we really need to reject that system for Confucian reasons in order that uh, women are able to genuinely or, uh, have, the, have the, the most open and equitable chance to, to grow. So, yeah, yeah,非常有意思,特别是后面一个问题,就是谈到这个gay 他会说 呃，儒家认为这个婚姻的主要目的呢，它其实就是这个繁殖后代啊。虽然这样讲的话比较这个特别simple，但实际上呢，这个儒家在这一点上，它是有一个基本的一个一个底线的。所以如果我们现在说，
uh, and remember, I don't think that it matters whether we're actually a sage. So this is about the progress of becoming Neishang, more Neishang and more Waiwang. They go hand in hand. So you cannot become more moral by yourself. You have to become more moral interacting with others. That's the Waiwang. Um, uh, so we grow morally through our engagement in society. Um, uh, and so that's, that's one direction, right? In order to become more moral, we have to also become more engaged. Um, but it works the other way also, which is to say the external sociopolitical environment has to be supportive of the individual moral growth. Um, uh, if the society is designed to stop certain people from growing morally, then that is a bad society um, uh, from a Confucian standpoint. It seems to me that someone who says Confucians cannot support gay marriage because, and the reason is that historically Confucians have never supported gay marriage. Um, if that's the reason, right? And, and uh, then um, that is someone who is overemphasizing Confucian past institutions and not paying enough attention to the core values that actually define the tradition, in my view, right? Because if you say we have to, uh, um, you know, we, we, we need to limit the possibilities for homosexuals or non-binary people or women or whatever category, we have to limit their possibilities of uh, socio-political engagement, limit the statuses that they can have. That's the same thing as saying, we need to limit their possibilities for moral growth. And no Confucian should say that. So if you're really a Confucian, then you're not in favor of resisting gay marriage. <laughs> if you're really a Confucian, you should uh, support gay marriage, not because of liberal reasons, but because of Confucian reasons, right? Um, uh, that's, that's what I think. Um, and also, I think that the resulting picture of relations between married spouses is a little different. Um, uh, right, a, uh, a liberal picture emphasizes e equality, right? Uh, um, doesn't talk about anything but equality, right? Whereas I think a Confucian picture of a relation between spouses talks about equal status in certain ways, equal opportunities, um, but emphasizes also the importance of complementary differences. Um, uh, that each and which can, which can change depending on you know before you have children after you have children when you're grown you know when you're older and you know all of these things um, uh, can change and there should be no assumption that one spouse has all the responsibility for doing something and the other one doesn't right um, you always need to be thinking about how the two different people are complementing one another um, encouraging one another to continue to grow. Um, uh, and uh, so I think that Confucians actually offer a quite distinctive perspective on marriage and other sorts of relationships. Um, uh, you know, progressive Confucians, prog you know, Confucians who are emphasizing this, this idea of moral growth. Oh,很有意思。呃，我想那个以以以以后有更多的时间，我们会就一些呃具体的问题再讨论嘛。那个，今天我想不可能展开那么多细的讨论。对，好，谢谢方老师。Okay, <笑> so next, uh, I think actually in the conversations between Stephen and Professor Fong, uh, some of the questions has already be related to the questions in the dialogue form. So maybe we can open the floor to the audience. Is there any questions? Or maybe Steven, you want to respond to the questions already put it here in the chat. So I think I see really one question um, mm -hmm. uh, from, from Dell. 
Bell, uh, yes. Which is, um, how is this particularly Confucian? Um, and uh, <laughs> which relates to the question that Professor Fong was just yeah. asking, I think, right? Um, yeah, yeah uh, it's very and similar. So, yeah, so I guess I, 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 I think I, I've given at least one kind of answer to that. Um, uh, so maybe I'll, it, it, please re-raise that question if you wanna press on that uh, further, but, but maybe we can take other questions. Yeah, okay. So is there any other questions? Maybe you can just open your micro and say something here. Oh, uh, hi, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Lee, uh, okay. can, you let yeah. me, can you let us know your name? Uh, you can call me Linda. Oh, Linda, okay, uh, please. My question is, uh, uh, in the uh, fast pace uh, society, I think it's, um, it's um, often difficult to achieve that uh, um, the, uh, some, some thoughts uh, or some idea of that, uh we we talk, we discussed like you said uh, um teach uh not to teach for uh or read for the test i mean mm -hmm. for some students uh i'm a student uh in, in the school we often uh to look through the book uh faster to uh deal uh with the test so um what do you think uh we can do uh to fit or suitable uh, to the thoughts you, you teach today? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and I do think that it's difficult. I agree with that. Um, uh, the um, students are in, in school, in college, uh, for many different reasons. Um, uh, they don't only go to college in order to grow morally. <laughs> Most of them probably, that's not the number one reason. Uh, um, and so I think there are many practical considerations. Um, I guess what I have tried to do is uh, to try to be experimental as much as I can in teaching um, and thinking about the, these other sorts of goals because I think in many ways they're compatible. Um, uh, so we can help students get the professional knowledge that they need to have, while at the same time emphasizing some of these other, I would say deeper kinds of goals. And I think the students will be happy. <laughs> I, th I think the students, whether they realize it or not, they have these questions um, uh, and they will realize that these are lifelong concerns. Um, so I think we're actually, doing our students a favor to the extent that we're able to um, shape our, our teaching to take uh, 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 this, this broader and deeper perspective to education into account. I get it, okay. thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So I think we don't have enough time left because we have already keep dipping for two hours. That is too long. So maybe we have the last question from Jianping. Okay. So, so you just you present. There's two questions, two people with hands raised. I'm I'm happy to stay uh, for uh, for those. Okay. <laughs> so if you agree with this, that I have no problem. So maybe Tian Ping, you um, ask the questions very quickly. You um, first. Okay. Um, Dr. Angle, long time no see. Thank you nice for to your see talk. You. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I just want to like quickly comment on your book and um. Uh, because I'm teaching a course on Confucian on good life and Confucianism and Confucian Confucius and Aristotle this semester at Wake Forest University. So uh, I think your book gives a really good example about how um, how down to earth Confucianism can be, like how it could reach the every single detail of of our contemporary life. So for example, what you did in in the chapter where you talk about renovate, uh, renovational attention, like where you give the example about how you, how we uh, usually ignore, you know, ignore everybody else when we are when we are in the bus or on the train, right? So, my question for you is that how did you came up come up with the idea <clears throat> of writing a book like this? Because, like you said, it's not 
100 percent uh uh, academic, right? It's more for the public. So my question for you, like, why, uh, what made you decide to uh, write a book like this? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And how about if we take Joseph's question also, and then I can answer both of them? Yes, please, Joseph. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, my question was regarding to one of the uh, points you brought up very early that forced growth can lead to spontaneous activity. Um, I was quite curious to learn more about that concept. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, all right, so uh, let's see. First, uh, uh, Hu Jianping, um, uh, the, um, I mean, I guess as I said uh, to, to, to Lisa, this the question of what it is to live as a Confucian, what it is to be a Confucian in the contemporary world is something that I have been increasingly conscious of, increasingly grappling with over, I, I don't know, uh, certainly my, my career in academia, and it, I wasn't aware of it as a question before then, um, uh, but uh, that it's become more and more uh, more salient and more and more something that I'm I'm, I'm thinking about, and uh, so I think what happened was that question was becoming so pressing for me at the same time as an opportunity emerged um, uh, to write a book like this. Uh, so I've been quite involved in the um, the sort of the movement within American philosophy uh, called philosophy as a way of life. Um, uh, I, I uh, co-directed a summer seminar funded by the NEH uh, a few years ago called Reviving Philosophy as a Way of Life, um, uh, which is partly about research, but really uh, very much also focused on pedagogy and what, the, what our goals are as philosophers. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so that, um, that also, that I think that teaching experience, and I've, I've experimented with a, doing a lot of different things of trying to make teaching um, uh, more live, relatable, if you like, um, uh, speaking to this dimension of, uh, of Confucianism. Uh, so things came together. Uh, this The series that the book is in, um, uh, it's called Guides to the Good Life, um, uh, published by Oxford. Um, there's a Every one of the books is terrific. Um, believe it or not, there is an amazingly wonderful book about the Kantian way of life, written by Karen Storr at Georgetown <laughs> University, which I really, really recommend. Um, uh, before you know, meeting, talking with Karen about this, I had no idea that Kant had written a really interesting essay about how to throw a dinner party. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so, anyways, there's there's just lots of riches in the series, and uh, you know, I hope that. My my book is contributing in some small way to to this uh, effort to to show the way in which philosophy is very much relevant to every aspect of our life. I think the way you put it was was really wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, uh, and uh, Joseph, the um, uh, so I think the the fake it till you make it idea um, uh, is. Is quite important for Confucians for the following reason. They talk a lot about the importance of ritual. Um, uh, and ritual is something that we do, at least initially, as we're growing up, impose on ourselves or have imposed upon us, right? It's not something that we necessarily embrace uh, fully. And yet, uh, and that's good because it helps to shape our behavior, it helps to shape the situations that we're in, in ways that allow for uh, us and others to grow uh, morally. Um, but the end goal is not simply one in which you're being shaped by external forces, right? The end goal is one where you can, you know, as you know, Confucius at age 70 is able to follow his heart's desire without overstepping the bounds. Um, that's spontaneity, that's not forced. And uh, so, you would expect, and indeed you find in uh, Confucian writings, a lot of worries about hypocrisy, about people who only do things for external reasons and not for, uh, and haven't undergone the internal transformation. 
Um, so what you end up with is, I think, a really fascinating balance of saying that the forced sort of forcing yourself, um, what I call conscientiousness, right? Really uh, trying to force yourself to do the right thing is important, but limited. It's, it's what I call a learner's virtue. Um, uh, and you can't truly become more fully moral without beginning to overcome conscientiousness. You shouldn't need it. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's a necessary part of the process. And I don't think there's any deep like tension or contradiction um, uh, in saying uh, that we force ourselves and gradually don't have to force ourselves anymore. There's a natural dynamic at play there. Um, uh, there's, you know, within the tradition, there's various reflections on, on whether there's some kind of tension. It doesn't seem to me that there is, um, uh, but, or at least uh, as long as one is also cautious about this hypocrisy dimension, uh, then we can avoid the, the sorts of problems uh, that might come from the, the, the force yourself part. Yeah, so thank you okay. so much. Yeah, okay, thanks. Stephen. Thank you, yeah, Dr. So, Engel. So maybe we can end it here. And thanks, Stephen, for your wonderful lectures. And also, thank you guys for your attending here. So, Paul, do you want to say something here? Uh, no, that was great. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen and Lee and everyone who participated. Um, just again, if you are interested in discussing this more, because I think, Stephen, you really opened up a lot of broad issues that are also very much up for debate, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think you you give like really great reasons why we should think about um, same-sex marriage and Confucianism or gender equality, right? And these are things you know, there are also things I think you would agree. They're not things that we sort of decide on definitively, but they're things we discuss, right? So um, if anyone is interested in having more of this discussion next week at the same time, um, I, I already put the uh, the link in the chat, but it's also there on the website. Um, we can continue the discussion. So, and I also actually read Stephen's new book and I definitely recommend oh. it to everyone. Yeah, so... <laughs> Um, check it out. It's a really great, like... Oh, I'm sorry, that is in the beginning. I didn't introduce this in your book. <laughs> yeah, but it's great, right? Because it, it has this, it's very readable. And you also get these sections where you have Neo-Confucians, you have contemporary scholars. So that this interweaving, right, of sort of everyday understanding mm -hmm. of like, mm -hmm. you know, Stephen doesn't like, uh, uh, what is it, those fenced in... Uh, <laughs> Gated communities. Gated yeah. communities, right? So you get, okay. You get things like this next to like, you know, Ivanhoe and, and Juicy. So uh -huh. it's, it's a really uh -huh. great book. Yeah, so. It turns out that my, my brother-in-law lives in a gated community and I'm, I'm getting, I've gotten to, into a little bit of trouble with one side of my family. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oops. <laughs> oops. <laughs> and, and I think as a person who's using this book in my class, and I think it's really uh, approachable for ex especially like undergrads, like yeah. in the US with no knowledge, like with no previous experience of Confucianism and it, which makes them feel like really um, like relatable and it, it's really accessible for them. You know what I mean? Like it, they, when they hear like Confucianism, then they think it's like, when they hear about like Confucianism, they always think it's a random dude, like from like 2000 years ago. <laughs> but when we actually, when we actually read the book in class, they were like, oh, actually I can learn how to become, you know, Confucian, uh, like in my daily life, you know? So I think it's a really <laughs> handy book also. Thank you. Thank you for writing this book. Oh, well, that's a wonderful. You're the first person I've heard of who's actually using it in a class, uh, Jinping. So uh, that, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So yeah, thanks okay. again, everyone. And we have events yeah. uh, every month. And next, starting in January, we'll have a bunch of different seminars as well, like mm -hmm. short courses. Mm -hmm. um, so you can just See check you. our website. See you next time. Yeah. Bye -bye. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. So much. Thank you. It's different. <laughs> I think I will write you uh, e in the email about my questions because we don't have time to uh, talk about it here. Oh, please do. Yeah. I'd love to hear. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, bye. Bye-bye.